the RPG Maker General Podcast, or the RPG MGP, your daily dose of vitamins A, C, XP, and meme. Welcome to the RPG Maker General Podcast, or the RPG MGP, your one-stop shop for everything RPG Maker. This is Cody, A.K. Marpix, and we got a nice full group today, uh, including returning star Carbonic. Hey, it's me. Hey. hey. It's Carbonic. <laughs> Our longtime pal, Silent Maid. Hey, it's me, Silent Maid. I'm still sleepy. <laughs> still working uh, as ever for a goff. I am so awake. And after a long absence, finally back from the depths of hell, the one, the only, Souls. What's up? How's it going? Oh, I was told I'm going to take the ah. moment now to uh, tell everyone to go buy Valkyrie profile for... Uh... Xbox 360. Oh, Xbox 360. No, 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 not gonna now, get now that. Now I understand how this podcast is funded. <laughs> <laughs> that was brought to you by Red Mage. I'm in his stead. What? Well, I already have it, but not for the 360. So too bad. Oh well. Can it be bought on PSN as well? I think I... it's on Steam. Ah. All right. Well, Gabe, you heard him. Keep them Steam bucks are coming. Anyhow, uh, today we're going to be doing what I call the combat update, uh, because a lot of cool stuff revolving around RPG Maker uh, combat came out recently. Enfly has two new plugins, the Enfly Counter Control and the Enfly Equip Change. Uh, let's go over Equip Change first. So that one, basically in uh, MV by default, you can only switch out your weapon and your shield, so what's in your hands. With Enfly's new plugin, you can not only switch those out, but you can also switch out your accessories, your armor, etc., and there's also a cooldown that you can use so that you can only switch once per turn. Yeah, I, I love this thing. Uh, man, it's just... I, when, I, when I first opened MV and I saw it, it was like cool and then I tested it and it wasn't the battle system that I wanted until the Antfly fixed it. <laughs> uh. No, seriously, like, my, like a big part of like one of my combat systems was like switching out your accessories for like the abilities they had, and then like the the default system was like, nope, trick you, haha. <laughs> uh, I ran into the same problem with the PS1 version of RPG Maker uh, because there's a certain so in the in the battle menu you have fight, magic, item, and equip, and I thought with equip you could change what your character had equipped, and I turned out terribly wrong. Equip simply allows you to invoke uh, your items. Like if, if, you know, using the Thunder Sword casts Thunder, that's how you do it. You don't use the item menu, you use the equip menu. Yeah, so. Wow, that... Can you rename that? Because that's really confusing. I don't think you can rename that specifically, but you can rename, like, uh, you can rename Magic and uh, Skill, so... Things that use MP don't have to be called magic, and things that use HP to cast don't have to be called skills. But so I... it it it's really just called equip. That that doesn't make sense at all. I mean, <laughs> if you could rename it to something else, then maybe it'd make more sense. But like, what? Yeah, but I mean, technically, it is your equipment that you're using, right? The, the other yeah. dumb thing with with the PS1 version is, uh, you know how classes are, right? You have like Dude, and dude is a fighter, okay? Okay. Well, in the PS1 version of RPG Maker, it's not called a class, it's called a skill. And if you don't have one assigned for a guy, then he has no skill. No skill. <laughs> yeah. So every time I make a, a new project in the PS1 version, I have to rename it to class. So now, if you uh, get recruited without having anything assigned, instead of having no skill, you simply have no class. Oh, fuck. No style, no grace. <laughs> Who's got a funny face? This NPC has a funny face. Anyhow, uh, the more got complex it. one that Yanfly came out with is the Yanfly counter control. So by default in yes. M yes. Uh, so by default in MV, the only thing you could do with the counter system is evade a physical attack and then retort with a physical attack. With Yanfly's new plugin, you can now get hit and then counter. You can also counter magic with uh, certain other abilities. And you can counter, say, wind magic with more wind magic. You can even uh, have a number of counters. 
so you can hit people a ton of times, and if they have a bunch of counters, you can just smack each other until one of you dies. So you can counter while you counter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, man. That's that's really complex stuff, by the way. It's like, I, I saw it in action in the video. It's crazy. Reactive abilities, too. That's great. That's a lot of that. A lot of uses can come from that. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I was thinking about it is you have uh, Celis from Final Fantasy VI, and she has an ability called Runic where you absorb magic and convert it into MP. Uh, mm -hmm. Something I'd like to do with that system is you have... Basically, an anti mage where the boys are back in town. Hey, the boys are back in town. Wow. Oh my goodness, we got a big podcast today. Jesus they Christ, the boys are back in town. <laughs> the enemy team had reinforcements all along. Uh, uh, back in town. The, the boys are back in town. Spread the word oh, around. The back in town. Okay. Um, you yeah. know what I have to say, though, about these scripts? Hmm. No, tell me. Tell me what you have to say about the scripts. Well, now I don't want to. <laughs> you, you will do as I say. Fine. The more of these scripts that, uh, what I mean to say is, the more of these scripts that get released, like, the more I realize just kind of how not improved RPG maker in base oh. is. It's uh. like... It, seriously, though, it's Enterbrain, right? Enterbrain is the company that makes it. Yep. Yes. Yeah, Enterbrain. Yeah. They're a very wealthy company, actually, and <laughs> they definitely have the um, budget to make this like good enough and big enough and working on their first release, but they they kind of just keep on releasing Drek that needs to be fixed by the fans. <laughs> yeah, it's fly, mostly. Uh, yeah, 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 on fly, mostly. But really, I get the feeling that, like, they're, they're kind of... they're kind of Bethesda for game creation software. They just release a completely... Uh, in a, a completely unfinished mess and expect modders to fix it. There's not much competition for that. That's the issue. Like, who yeah, else is there releasing, like, RPG maker engines? And, and the only real competition that they potentially might have had, they've already bought up. Uh, well, there you go. Capitalism at, at its finest. Um, what, well, like, oh, one might have eventually become an RPG maker competitor, but... Now they're owned by Interbrain. Yeah. Capitalism ho! Ah, uh, yeah, but that's not even capitalism, because capitalism works off the idea of having competition, and this is just a monopoly. <laughs> monopoly ho! Yeah. <laughs> what I find interesting about uh, MV in particular is the sprites have gone up to 48 by 48, but they're still the square style, so... You're, you're basically just taking everything and making it a little bit more complex. And I, I don't know what it is, but I'm not a big fan of the square style. And especially now that they're 48 by 48 or what have you, now they have to look really, really good or you have to use the character creator. I think that certain aspects of the engine, like the art, are getting beyond where amateurs would be able to edit them with any sort of consistency. And basically you're forced to use the stock assets, or you go find a competent uh, pixel artist to commission. True, but you could argue that that's why they put in the generation assets in the first place. Mm. And I do have to give it to them. The generator is probably like the most improved thing since Ace. Jesus Christ, let's just take a moment of silence to remember the character generator in VX Ace. I don't think a moment of silence is going to make for a very good podcast, but <laughs> we've never we've never done a very good podcast anyway. So what the hell? Let's do it. Come on, just bow your heads and pray.
All right, now okay, somebody... I think that's good enough. Uh, <laughs> when you when you edit it, can you like have like pictures of the <laughs> of the generator? Like... Uh, Slowly sinking into an ocean. Now, which generator was that? Was that the one with the uh, the terrible face on it, or? Yeah, yeah. Oh god damn it! When you when you edit it, can you like like uh, put pictures of the old generator in? Like yeah, just yeah. He, here, slowly, um, slowly fade it in and out. <laughs> <laughs> or may, maybe you can um, maybe you could just have them as the enemies for the thing. <laughs> and I've got some old VXA um, face generation assets that I painted over to make them look better. Mm. See if I can find those for you guys. Uh, you know what my my favorite character face generator is? It's a balloon duel on new grounds. And basically, you just make a dude that has like balloons out of his back, and then you fly around and pop other people's balloons. But there are so many different hairstyles and things. I I love it so much. Basically, it was Mies before Mies existed. Hair is the hardest thing to find good assets of for generation. Weapons. But the weird thing about the VX Ace thing was it made all of the faces. Like symmetrical, almost perfectly symmetrical, and well, it, it led them to looking like fucking aliens. That works for me because I try everything with <laughs> symmetry too. It's because the front view they had was like weird. It's it's a little unnatural to have a face that's looking directly straight, you know. So it's a yeah. little weird. I mean, with the three fourths view, it's kind of better. Yeah. I think that as the uh, fidelity has gone up, the amount of symmetry in people's faces really stands out and makes it look alien. So if you have an RPG, say, like, on the Super Nintendo, you can have a symmetrical face and no one's going to care. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that's the solution then. We'll just use the VXA's uh, generator, scale it down, scale it back up, then it'll look fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Impression. and your imagination will fill in the gaps and give them extra wrinkles or what have you. <laughs> All right. Man, I will say a cool plugin if it hasn't already been made because I, I don't use MV, but um, is there a way to have multiple parallaxes as in yes. layers? Yeah, there's already a couple of really good programs for that. I, or I think movies. someone worked on it, yeah. That's pretty good, because I, I'm trying to make a night sky, and the problem is, if I want clouds going in front of it, I can't do that, because it means that stars will also scroll, as well as a moon, and I don't want that. What you right. probably want is, um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Chaos's Ultimate Overlay, um, K-A-U-S. Hmm. I'll get check it out. Now, quick question, because I haven't touched MV at all yet. Uh, sure. If you make a parallax map, that's basically just a picture that you throw down, then you put events around it to establish boundaries, correct? Mm-hmm. All right. Um, more or only, less. And you can only have one of those, uh, so... I See, I thought you could only have one in the first place. Like, if you throw down a map, then, hey, there's your map. And the default uh, one that shipped with the program, yeah. But, like, with Chaos... Chaos I'm just going to call him Chaos... With Chaos's um, plugin and a couple of other ones, uh, they can be you know under the player, over the player, underneath the map itself, so that it's overriding what would normally be the parallax. Hmm. Uh, and it supports by default five. Um, I think the parallax layer itself, a ground, um, a light, and a shadow layer. Ah, so with that, conceivably, you could have a river that's full of transparent pixels and have like a rippling water effect uh, going underneath the map I don't know about animation I haven't I haven't tried to uh, force animation through those uh, plugins yet okay. I'll be looking at it myself though you can have like a train scene where like everyone's standing on top of a train and the rest of the background's moving really fast <laughs> that would be really cool yeah, it would be cool, because it happens in RPGs, like, once. It's on the stove, dear. It's on the stove. Oh, shut up. Uh. <laughs> Who dat? <laughs> uh, I cohabitate with my girlfriend. 
We have a new friend. Invite oh. on the podcast. Fucking hell. I didn't, I, realize Cody, I didn't realize Cody was a fucking breeder over here. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, Cody, she's all of our girlfriend now. She's the podcast girlfriend. Oh. Now, <laughs> now, <laughs> now, my fucking it. girlfriend. That wasn't me talking. Oh, that was Fergoff. Oh, that's someone you beloved. Fergoff. Fergoff. I need to tell my new beloved that I love her. Bring her over. <laughs> she can hear you just fine. <laughs> Let her know that her boyfriend is one of six now. We've become a unit. We live and die together. That's the that's the rule of the podcast. That's the harsh rule of the RPG MGP. None of you are fucking allowed to touch Guardboard Chan, though. Is that a Pokemon? Oh, right, right. right. As if, man. That's gross. You... No, no. You, you haven't you, seen you... it. You should see his avatar and the picture it came from. So, I was on, a couple days ago or so, I was on eBay and I was searching for new things to buy with my pocket cash because I, I'm a fucking waste of space and, space and I like to collect toys or whatever. <laughs> so I decided to look up Pokemon toys because we had been talking about Pokemon almost every single podcast. So... On one of the very first pages, I found this listing, and I couldn't really tell what it was when I saw it as a thumbnail, so I just clicked on it, and um, it's this absolutely terrible 30-inch tall homemade Gardevoir plush toy, <laughs> which is, it looks like it's got a chicken McNugget head that's been molded to look sort of like a Gardevoir mixed with a um, Wolf. furry. Yeah, a, a wolf furry. And um, the, the title is, Look, 30-inch Gardevoir Pokemon life-size life plush doll, woman anime girl, big jumbo. <laughs> and in the description, they list it as, Clothing is removable, realistically, anatomically, correct. Which, ah, uh, <laughs> I am very disturbed. And... To anyone who wants to shell up forty nine fucking dollars for this piece of dreck, they can do that. The funny thing is, I'm sure forty dollars worth of effort has gone into that, despite how bad it looks. Yeah. Now, okay, the legs. Look at the legs. They haven't been turned inside out. Because when you sew things, you're supposed to t sew them or turn them inside out after you're done. It looks like they made a Gardevoir doll, but they turned it inside out. It just looks like an inside out Gardevoir. Mm. Maybe. Uh, if I may play spoiler really quick, uh, so it says life size 30 inch plus, right? Yeah. Gardevoir's official height is 5 feet and 3 inches, so they are full of shit. Yeah, no. Oh, so what's the fucking point? Who wants <laughs> one? <laughs> okay, so. It's not a real uh, they, Pokemon. They've got, it, what the a picture, they've, they've got this picture, and it's comparing it. Uh, they're comparing it to a can of uh, expensive seltzer water, and it, it looks just big enough to put your dick between the legs. So, I think that was in design. Oh, so geez. it's it's as good as you need it to be. You don't deserve yep. to be spoiled. No one does. It, Oh. It's like those personal massagers. They can't tell you what they're actually for in the catalog. You just have to know what they built it for and then buy it. Yeah. So, if you, let's see here. I guess we should move on uh, to the normal part. Uh, so, Project Progress, what are you guys working on right now? Nothing? I'm working Great. on... All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm working on... I, I just uh, wanted surprise. other people to go first. That's RPG Maker General in a nutshell, right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm just working on making some skies for my game because they used to just be photos put through filters, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm actually working on spriting some skies up. I know, I bet I bet those photos are pretty cool. I mean, your game has like a weird feel to it anyway, and I, I would I would imagine that kind of contributes to that. I mean, yeah, I've, I've still got them on backup if these ones don't work out, so... Yeah, I'm not going to tell you how to make a game, man, because you're the most successful one out of any of us. You don't need advice from a fucking wastrel like me. <laughs> you know what I've been working on this week? 
I went, I went and I did my daily shop and I bought a tub of frosting because I thought I can put this on parts of my body and lick it off when I'm camming. That's what I've been working on. Nice. Perfect. You're going to break your neck like that or whatever. No, man, I'll just put it on the easily reachable parts, like my fucking nibs. You can, you can reach That's them. That's not easily reachable. <laughs> That's not for you. I'm a professional. I'm just going to put it on the easily reachable parts. Don't worry, like my elbow. I'm just going <laughs> to... <laughs> professional giraffe. <laughs> Sam Windsor, professional giraffe. Uh, Fergaf, what are you up to? Uh, I am busy making transition videos and figuring out how I want to do scene transitions um, between rooms, um, which is a little difficult because uh, RPG Maker assumes uh, that your view uh, encompasses all of the events on the screen, but my HUD blocks off the leftmost and rightmost uh, sides of the view and the top two and bottom two uh, rows of events per map. So. That's been interesting. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so I heard that the computer versions of RPG Maker, they don't run events unless they're on screen. So say an NPC is supposed to move randomly, they don't actually move if they're not on the screen. Is that correct? Um, that depends on the version, I believe. Because I know VX Ace will do it. That's part of the reason why it was so slow. Uh, yeah, see, with the PS1 version, uh, they would actually work on screen and you would see NPCs move into the screen it, as part of the random movement and I think that not having that makes the a game feel less immersive and like I guess progress for me yes all right I'm still working on the collab how long have I been working it's been a month or something right it's, it's like I'm so disappointed in myself I'm trying to work on this thing you're not allowed to be disappointed in yourself until you've broken my record. <laughs> How long have you been working on it? Oh, man, man. No, that's the thing. Because, uh, like, I'm working on it, but I feel like I'm going to eventually surpass that. <laughs> it's going to be like, like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> like, I am working on it a little bit at a time, like, but still, still, like, my progress is, is like, too slow for my comfort. Oh man, it's like, like okay, well, I got, I got like some of the battles and some of the cutscenes going on, but like, uh. <clears throat> I mean, don't don't let yourself get don't get yourself down on time because games are stuff are something that ta takes a really long time to make, and I, I see a lot of uh, devs just get like really pissed or. Er, I'm not talking about you here, but um, I've seen a lot of uh, starting out devs get uh, impatient with their work and just quit the whole scene um, because it's not done in like a week or so. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, um, it's like what I said last week uh, or the week before, like, like whatever the time estimate you extend that because it's not gonna fit in your first time estimate <laughs> yeah no but still my first estimate was two weeks i don't want it to be extended to a month <laughs> or two yeah 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 how, how close are you to finishing do you think like fuck <laughs> like because i i released like 12.5 and that was like just cut scenes and then right now i'm working on cut scenes plus battle and that for some reason that's taking longer then what happened with the two point at uh, the twelve point five? <laughs> it's like, uh. However, because I already have one boss battle set up, I can like base it off of that, and then it'll be easier. Mm. So I have I have a basis now for something, so it's easier to do in the future. So I, I'm on. I got something now. That that's good. Yeah, combat is really really hard to do. Yeah, combat sucks when you don't have, like, uh, a setup pro like, when you don't have a setup, it sucks super bad. Yeah. And, uh, that's some really great advice if we can transition into that, is, uh, you can only be better than yourself last week. 
you can't really compare your skill to other people. You can only improve and make yourself better, you know? I guess. Like, uh, I, I have somewhere in my house a, a notebook from second grade of all of my short stories that I wrote, and they are garbage, and I hate them. And I wish I had thrown it out when I when I thought to do it a couple years ago, but I'm glad I have it because it reminds me of how far I've come. I am now good enough at writing that I can cringe at the other things I wrote. And you know what? Maybe in 10, 15 years, I can cringe at Defeat the Darkness after it's done. <laughs> Be like, yeah, well, that's but- something I'm always afraid of. I mean, it's bound to happen, but, like, the idea that in, in ten or so years I'm going to be like, oh, what an absolute shit looking back at my own stuff. <laughs> no, that's good, though. That's progress. But, like, but like, what I'm afraid of is, like, I'm going to have me from one week ago, like, look up over my shoulder and be like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I'd be like, like... Like, I'm sorry, I, I got less powerful <laughs> as the time goes on. Uh, you have grown weak and slow, Robin. <laughs> I'm sorry, Master! <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, so, does anyone else have any advice for all the up-and-coming RPG devs out there? Don't get discouraged. No, don't Excellent. get discouraged. Yeah. yeah. If you're doing, that, if you're doing a big project... Try to set little like goals. Milestones. Like, yeah. Like, mm-hmm. like what I try to do is like put in at least like twenty to thirty minutes a day, because even if it seems small, once you get into the rhythm, you might end up putting like an hour or two. But having uh-huh. that like small expectation of yourself can help just like get you going and warmed up. Yeah, that's that's one more thing I want to say. Like, if you're if you're doing a project, you have to put in a little time every day. You don't have to do anything. You just have to like spend a little time every day so you can like accustom yourself to it. Cuz like we all know you have those uh, writer blocks or whatever. Like you're going to have days where you don't feel like anything. Just open it anyway and then look at it. And so you at least know what what you were doing last time. Right? Mm-hmm. So you can so you can have a schedule for yourself and like so you'll know what you're doing last time cuz some devs I know are like, are like, they did a lot of work one time, and then they're like, okay, I'll take a break because I deserve it. And then they took a, like a break, and then when they come back, they're like, what the fuck was this? How did this work? And then like, like, there they abandoned it because they they forgot. You can mitigate some of that with documentation, but uh, if I can talk to the people who are new to RPG Maker or game making in general, I do have two specific pieces of advice that I like to give out all the time. Um, the first is, go small your first time. Don't yep. don't aim for four hours. Don't aim for 30 hours. Do, like, 20 minutes of gameplay. Um, and don't get hung, hung up on the details. Don't, don't care about your maps looking pretty. Um, get them functional first. Get your gameplay down. Yes, get them RTP. Mm-hmm. Yes. I can confirm it's always a good idea to start small. Don't go for four. Start with one, maybe one and a half. It's a bit ambitious, and- but you can do it if you're dedicated. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. If, I don't. Know if, I don't know if I'm talking about like inches or fingers, but like <laughs> whatever. It's a shit. It's a sex joke. You know me. I'm Sam Windsor. I talk about my ass. I put things in my ass. Let's uh, talk about our uh, maker instead. My content not... bollocks. Why did I come here? <laughs> oh, um, I have some real. Uh, I, I have some advice that I'd like to give, and I don't hear this very often. Um, but I think it's actually important. Uh, get outside. Um, and go places. That sounds kind of like like an insult. That sounds, but um, what I mean is. You'll find a lot more inspiration, I think, from going to newer places and seeing what they look like and getting a feel for them rather than hanging out in your room and wondering what this place looks like. It's true. It's an unfortunate fact of like writing and making. Yeah. You need you need life experience. Like I went to a water pumping station today mm-hmm. and it had it was this really cool place, um, and it 
was covered in all of these smart panels, and it's it was filthy. It was awesome. Um, but if I hadn't gone there, I wouldn't have an idea of what this place looks like. Um, all right. Yeah, one of the tips I read to, to be a successful writer is the only time you should be in isolation is when you're writing because every time you go outside and you experience something, you talk to a new person, you gain a new perspective that you can then put into your story. That mm-hmm. extends to game design, too. Prototype stuff often. Just do do crazy shit, like try and figure out how this particular mechanic works and then dump it. Um, don't invest a whole game into that one successful combo hit mechanic that you really like. Um, just take it as, you know... The thing that it is, and remember it for later. But yeah, I, I'd say it's a good idea to make concept art and stuff while you're outside or where, when you're somewhere, or if you're planning on making grass or whatever, making stuff based on plants, going to somewhere and looking at plants, because it'll give you a much better idea of how they actually work than just straight up trying to do them on your own. Yeah. And the other thing is, if you want to do any kind of research, Wikipedia is so technical. It will, it's very good at telling you the what's, but it's not good at telling you the how's or the why's. And that's when asking questions and going outside really helps. Because, uh, you know, you can, you can look at a plant on Wikipedia, you can read about photosynthesis, but you don't know certain things like how flowers will bend to to make sure they're always staring at the sun throughout the day. Like, that was something I learned in second grade is, you know, we had, like, a potted plant. And after a couple days, it would point itself towards the sun. Well, then you rotate the plant, it's pointing, you know, towards the classroom now. It will eventually find its way back towards the sun. Dude, dude, that, that, that that's fucking scary, man. <laughs> <laughs> the plants, man. Plants, I'm scared of plants. Nah, you want, you want to know the... The, the realest piece of advice anyone could give you. Give it. Simply find some really obscure material. Like, especially, like, because no one reads nowadays. Look up some obscure books and just steal little, like, ideas from everything. <laughs> and then combine it into your game. And then if anyone accuses you of copying it, just be like, yo, I don't read. I don't know what that is. And you're good. <laughs> Fuck. I mean, um... I mean, it's it's true though because I I see too many people who are really freaked out about all of their ideas being completely original, yeah. and that that's not as big of an issue as um, people think. But but like I, I think everyone should definitely take inspiration from something. It's impossible not to take inspiration from something, and if you. Um, Tell yourself not to, you'll only hurt the integrity of your work. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was something I struggled with for a very long time because I was I was doing my best to be creative in, like, first and second grade. And I was also a big fan of the, uh, the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes. And mm-hmm. at that point, it was one of the funniest and most insightful things I had seen in my young life. And so a lot of stuff I did uh, was either stolen directly from it or slightly inspired by it. And my brother, basically every time I did something, would go, You stole that from Calvin and Hobbes! And I... (laughs) (laughs) And I carried that with me for so many years. So, so many years. And then only, you know, a couple years ago did I try working on Defeat the Darkness. And for the life of me, I tried to make it as original as possible. I, I did everything the hard, rocky, difficult way. Because I wanted something that people would not be able to pin down and say that it was a rip-off of X or Y. You know, when you hear that stuff when you're young, it hurts. And it took me until my early 20s to uh, actually make something and and call it my own. And I think I could have gotten started on my career a little bit faster with a little bit more copyright infringement. You know, you're young, you should experiment, you're not trying to sell your stuff, and that's when you should really be, you know, taking inspiration and figuring out what you like, what you love, and, and knowing what works. Yeah. yeah. That being said, don't don't completely steal the works of others, and then don't plagiarize. Unless yeah. you think you could get away with it. Unless you're sure you could get away with it. Yeah, plagiarizing <laughs> is no good. 
If you want, if you want to plagiarize someone, don't copy them. Steal their idea and make it better. Mm. Mm. You, you want to know the weirdest way to get inspired for a story? Do you know how many times I would see a trailer for like a movie, right? Mm-hmm. And I would try to like guess what the story of the movie is, and the the story would end up being completely different. But now I had this like basically original idea for like a story that ended up being really good. Mm. Yeah. I think that's, a, that's an interesting exercise I guess you could do. Watch trailers and try to guess the story. Um, yeah. We actually had that happen at a, at a bad movie night at my house a couple months ago. The idea was to buy something you've never seen at a thrift store and then show it up for everyone to see. Someone ended up with, like, a disc three of an anime, so we had zero context about how these characters got to where they were. <laughs> and... And so, you know, we're seeing we're seeing the final episode, we're seeing the conclusion, but we never saw the beginning, so how on earth did they end up on this planet? Who are these people? What are they like? Why are they all speaking Japanese? Like <laughs> <laughs> What the fuck is this language? Moonspeak? I guess it's the future. Yeah. They were all like uh they were all idols and they ended up in like idol dimension and every idol that was already there had turned into someone else. So the anime was called uh Idol I project, have... I believe. Oh. Yeah. For for a second there, I thought you were talking about like I- Interstellar five 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 mm-hmm. or whatever. <laughs> the um, Daft Punk movie. Uh, That's a really good movie. Hmm. If you haven't um, seen that movie, whoever's listening, go go watch that movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now time for the realest advice ever. Back your shit up. Yay! Yeah, put that shit on um, Dropbox. If yeah, you have, back. If you get a Dropbox account, just do it. That way, you never have to remember to do it. It's already done for you. And if you're if you're on uh, Ace, and you have it on Steam, it actually uploads to the Steam Cloud by itself. So then you're good. Okay, my Depends problem with that, that, my problem what? with that is that it's it's a good idea, and I'm glad they did that. But it's so fucking slow. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It takes a good ten minutes to save each time. It's weird because as good of an idea as that is, they didn't do that for MV. They didn't? No. No. Uh, I guess I guess they couldn't really speed it up because it does what it does is it does a full upload of RPG Maker into the Steam cloud. Rather than don't... rather than just saving your project, it just uploads the entirety of the RPG Maker folder. To the cloud. Yeah. Oh wow. I actually turned it off because it was it was so slow, and I would save like every like thirty seconds. So yeah. Just a pain. But they should still like have the option. That's weird that they took it out completely. If you want to work like we do in the industry, by the way, um, you can take it a step further and not use Dropbox. You can figure out how to use Tortoise Git or Tortoise SVN if you're on Windows, and uh, then you can have branches and versions that you can revert to if things get screwed up. Hmm. Now virgins, that sounds good. I should start working in RPG Maker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I think uh, I have about fifty versions of uh, Defeat the Darkness on my on my laptop. Because every time I save, it's a it's a new save, so I can go back as far back as 2012 and just Ooh. play that version how it stood at the time. Ooh, that's expensive. <laughs> In disk space, that is. Uh, not for the PS1. It's uh, 128 mi- uh, kilobytes. <laughs> oh, good. Well, okay, in that case, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The PC can be disturbing. So uh, let's head to the subject at hand finally combat and RPGs. This is something uh, that we haven't actually touched on quite yet. Uh, now, first off, there are a lot of RPG Maker games, you know, such as uh, Yume Nikkei and Eve and all these, where combat is either very light or it's non-existent. They're basically uh, not quite walking simulators, more like puzzle games or, or simple action games. Yep. Now, do, do you guys think that combat in RPGs is necessary? No. No. No, it's not. Nope certainly shows up in a lot. Um, it, it leads to an entire progression mechanic, so I mean, if you want more hours, that's an easy way to get them. Yeah, I, I will say that um, 
in this day and age, people are a lot less, uh, um, a lot less accepting of walking simulators than they used to be. <laughs> eh, it depends. It's definitely gotten a little. Well, more... yeah, because like, if it's too short, people will notice, right? Yeah. And, okay. Okay. Like, let's take uh, Dear Esther because I think that's the most. Prominent example of walking simulator. Yeah. Right. Because, yep. okay, so you walk to one point, and then story bit, and then you walk to the next area, that's the story bit, and then you walk to the next area, story bit. In essence, that's fine, but, like, nothing happens in between, or nothing happens during. Yeah. And then, like, that's the thing, it's just really empty and really, really, you know, bland for most people. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, they, I know they were trying to get, to get, like, that feeling kind of across a little bit, but there's, there, there has to be, a, like, a balance. Uh, what was that recent one? Um, everyone's Gone to Rapture. I think they kind of explained that they did it on purposefully, but, like, I think... I believe they also have like some puzzles and stuff in between, so it'll break up the monotony, right? Yeah. I yeah. thought the beginner's guy did a pretty good job of that. Um, not a perfect job, um, but a better job than most. Uh, yeah. Yes, that is that is a good walking simulator because it has a lot of stuff that breaks up the monotony, and it's a really interesting process. I will say, Dear Esther is a um, a frustrating case for me because um, I have a lot of complaints with uh, that title because of the same reasons you say, but it does handle the Source Engine in a very good way. It's very good at using a ten-year-old engine, or actually almost twenty now, um, a twenty-year-old engine to look really actually good but it has very little actual substance to it. It's a very slow burn in that sense, and that's not the reason I play video games. If I were to, you know, if I wanted to be comfy and chill, I would probably pop in my copy of Monty Python and the Holy Grail and watch that. That's my idea of a, of a comfy night. But when I play video games, it's about execution and skill, and you're not going to get a high score in Dear Esther. That's not how the game is played. Mm-mm. Um, and you got to keep in mind the changing demographics. Um, like, it's not the 90s anymore. People are starting to get a little bit... Well, okay, there's there's still new people coming in to the industry. Um, but as people are getting older, they're having less time, and so uh, there's starting to be some favoring towards games that have shorter, like, almost episodic breakages, um, natural points where it ends every 10 or 20 minutes, so you can put it down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I see that, and something like Final Fantasy One's Marsh Cave would not go over well in this day and age, because you can only save outside of it, and then you have to slog through all of the, this entire dungeon with a high encounter rate, and then come back out and fight a boss, and all these other things, and it's very draining on your resources, and you also kind of have to grind to be able to get in there in the first place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think especially with how RPG design is right now, you should favor it being too easy over being too hard. Uh, yes. And that's not only because of people's lack of time, but it's also because you want it to be able to be played by people who aren't going to play it perfectly. Uh, for example, like uh, Suikoden is a very, very easy game if you know what you're doing. You, you know how to manage healing, you know elemental weaknesses, you know that this guy and this guy have a really overpowered combo attack that you can just spam to beat normal enemies. But uh, that's... and people who can do that can just advance through the story as much as they want. But when I first played it, when I was around 13 years old, I didn't know any of that. I used the characters I liked, and I was still able to brute force my way through the game while being stupid. And you want stupid people, or kids, or whoever, to be able to beat your game without needing to look up a guide, because when you break the flow like that and force people to look up a wiki or something, you end up in this situation where not everyone can enjoy your game, because they either have to look up 
a wiki, they have to use characters or strategies they don't want or like, or they just give up. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it all kind of comes back to, uh, you know, people, people have less time in general, so they're not going to tolerate fail states as much as they used to. There, there's, there's still an audience for it. And by all means, if you're going after for it, go after for it. Just recognize that it's much smaller than it used to be. Yeah. Uh, I feel that uh, a lot of the PlayStation Final Fantasies, as in two of them, 7 and 9, got that right. Uh, I know that Nintendo's philosophy is that 40% of your game should be able to be completed by anybody. And the Mario games, even though their quality has you know, slid down over time, they still retain that. You know, the main game, you go through the areas, you beat Bowser. Most people can still do that, but they still have challenging levels for people who have been doing this, you know, for X amount of years. You can still go through these challenge levels and have your skills pushed to their limit. And if mm -hmm. you are not that good, if you're just a kid and you want to get through the game and beat the game, you can still beat the game with a basic knowledge of it. Uh, 7 and 9 have these bonus bosses where your skills as an RPG player are actually tested, and you are rewarded for being really good at uh, managing your skills and equipment. You also gotta think on on like the level for like us amateur RPG makers. Professional, professional like let's say AAA games or like they have big budget marketing or whatever, even they have trouble like finding like the niche for like people who enjoy difficult games that's why games have gotten like so easy in general so people and especially like if you're making a game on here chances are you're relying heavily on like word of mouth like if you want your game to get around so if you make a game that's too hard and it turns off that first maybe like dozen or so people who actually like give it a shot the game could just like die right there pretty much mm -hmm. You don't have that kind of luxury of like a market uh, or you know marketing that like a normal game would, which is unfortunate, but it's just like one of those things. Yeah. I think the best way to do it would be like Dark Souls, where if you apply just enough thought, you'll understand how. So, for example, you have this this uh, a knight character early on and then no one can beat this knight they have no clue how he's too armored you can't brute force it but someone you know gets to be smug and go well did you try casting magic and, and it turns out he's really weak to magic and and if you were smart enough to figure that out well then hey you beat the battle easily and that could build interest you know because uh you are rewarded for being smart in that case. And it would still technically be an easy battle. Someone would just have to tell you how to do it. Uh, and there's a sliding scale there from 1 to Chalgmar. And uh, Chalgmar is this boss in Bravely Default. And he basically turned me off of the game. Because you, you have to endure a really powerful attack. And then wail on him. And then heal and repeat. And then after that you have the dragons, which are technically optional, but... You have to grind uh, for an ability called the Greater Spirit Ward, which protects you from elements. And if you don't have that specific ability, then you cannot beat those dragons, and you cannot uh, unlock a certain class. And that's kind of towing the line there, but it is optional content. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot of pushback these days also on, on those bosses, which some people would call gimmick bosses, um, because there's only one real way to beat them. Um, that... All other ways are potentially possible, but um, are he either heavily luck-dependent or require you to super over-level. So, were, were all the bosses in Ocarina of Time gimmick bosses? Well, yes, but the game, like that whole series, is built off of, you know, unique um, new items and discovering how to use them, and the boss is basically a you know, your graduation ceremony. <laughs> so, you've learned how to use this item. Congrats. I wish there were more games like that. Like, I wish more games just wholesale ripped off Zelda, because <laughs> Zelda's great, and nobody else is making games that are like that. 
Like, the only one I can think of is Darksiders, and that's only a little bit similar. Like, that's like a blend of a few genres. Did you guys say Platinum Games tried to buy the Darksiders IP back in, like, 2012? No. Pretty good. Man, that would have been good. I don't know if any of you have played Darksiders, but it's a really... It's, like, the best 3D action game outside of games made by Platinum or Clover Studios. And, like, if they got their hands on it, it would have been... It would have been hard. Yeah. It would have been pretty, pretty Wait, are you saying Darksiders or Dark Souls? Darksiders. Darksiders. Uh, uh, Darksiders right. sounds familiar, and yet it doesn't. Who made it? You're thinking uh-huh. of Darkstalkers, the Capcom fighting game. Uh, no, 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 I, no, no, Dark, Darksiders. Darksiders is with the uh, the Four Horse Apocalypse guys. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like it's like Zelda. And who's it's that? Cool. It was made by THQ, but when they went <laughs> under, their their segments got auctioned off. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, it was made by Vigil, um, published by THQ, but Vigil basically no longer exists. I remember the first one was really good. Like, it's like one of the few games where I went out of my way to like do optional, like get like optional armor and shit. Mm-hmm. See, I, really I never played. Amazing. I never played the first one, but I played the second, and from what I heard, the second one was better than the first one. I heard the opposite, actually. That's all right. Uh, I think it's that way, objectively. You know, we gotta fight now. That's what that. Means. Yeah, it seems like <laughs> it. I mean, neither of us have played the game that the other one's talking about, but <laughs> just on principle alone. <laughs> I, I played too. I just I never beat it. I've played both. What did you think? Uh, Which one was best? Too, I actually. I'm talking it up a lot, but I haven't beaten two either. <laughs> so I guess you concede. I win. I win the duel now. Okay. Yeah. I guess. I guess so. I guess one's better. <laughs> yeah. It's official. RPG Maker uh, podcast. Dark Side is one is better. <laughs> okay. So we were talking about whether or not having a um, battle system in your game is a good idea. Like, what? What kind right. of? Uh, how do you guys feel about the Paper Mario battle system? Okay, Those first, are... first I, I want to just say, I, I want to just say that like, uh, combat is not, uh, combat is optional for RPG Maker games, but it's, I think it's a good idea to put it in anyway, because if you don't have that, you'll have to put something else in to like uh, avert the person's attention because. If you're just going to have a story, like a whole big cutscene straight, um, that's nice and all, but that's not a game. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if, it's just, and if you're just going to be walking between scenes, that's also nice, I guess, but that's still not a game. Yeah. You have to have something, like even like some puzzles in between or like, or like, like the battles, right? Yeah. You... You have to have at least s- some of it. You can't have it the same all the time because that's gonna suck as well. But you have to vary it up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. And uh, then like, I'm I'm gonna give an example here. That's weird. Um, God, like the God of War series, we all kn- we all know it as the super violent God killing simulator. And like you you kill things, you kill harpies, you kill whatever monsters. Like you like. A bazillion gallons of blood per screen. <laughs> but, like, they always have, like, certain puzzle parts in between some sections. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And in some interviews with the devs, they, they give a good reason for this. No. Because these, these puzzles, they are kind of annoying, but they are all really easy. And that's part of why they're a little annoying. But they need that. Because they have to break up the combat. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you just had combat in between every room and every for the whole way, no one's gonna get excited about that, and no one's no one's gonna feel good with it. Yeah. The reason there's puzzles is because they need the lull in action. They need the oh, this is the part where there's not gonna be a battle, and it's not gonna be exciting. They need that so that when there is a battle, the player can be like, "Oh yeah, 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 yeah." Yeah, you, you want know? the the variety and the uh, the up and down of action. Mm-hmm. 
it's also uh, important to keep in mind the genre that you're working in as to whether you should have or shouldn't have combat in your game. Like, uh, yeah, um, if you're fantasy, um, people are going to expect it. They'll be surprised if you don't have it. Um, if you're doing drama, that's weird, but yeah, I could see it. Um, if you're doing horror, I don't advise it in most cases. It's hard to pull off combat in a horror game and have it come off as horrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it flies in the face of all the things that anyone that ever does horror would tell you to do, which is like, the first rule is you don't show Freddy Krueger in the first frame, you definitely sh don't show his full body, and you definitely don't keep showing him for minutes long. <laughs> yeah. The effect wears off. Hmm. Although a lot of people like the Silent Hill games, and they have combat. This is true. Um, I think Silent Hill does a good job of keeping it still somewhat horrifying, even though it still kind of gets a little dull. It has its set piece moments, which picks things pick things back up. Yeah, I think with uh, not only Silent Hill but also Resident Evil and the uh, ancient Alone in the Dark games on PC, there is there's no such thing as a random encounter. Uh, every yeah. encounter is fairly deliberate, and it brings up uh, tense resource management. Yes, mm -hmm. and that's what it's about tension. But, um, in general, when it comes to like combat, like if you're not gonna put it in there, you're gonna have to have really good like writing and like yeah. world building and characters and stuff to make up for it. I mean, obviously, I can't speak because I don't know everyone making RPG making games, but chances are, the average person isn't gonna be able to pull that off. Like you're gonna need like a very above average writing to really like make it worth it for someone to go through an RPG with no sort of combat. So I, I guess it boils down to what people play games for. So God of War, hard combat, easy puzzles, because people aren't there for the puzzles. They just want to, you know, that's there to, to break up the combat. And you don't, you don't want people stuck on those all day. They want to get back to the action. Whereas RPGs are more about story. So if people don't like the combat or don't care for the combat, you want it to be easy so they can get on with the story. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, hey, Carbonic, didn't you have a question? What do you mean? Well, I, I'm pretty sure that we just blatantly ignored something you said about 15 oh, minutes oh. ago. Oh, uh, As in, um, what do you guys think about specifically Paper Mario? Okay. Oh, uh, I like that I... it's fast response. That's uh, that's what I think I like the most about it. It's very fast response. What do you mean by fast response? Um, as in, you hit a button, a thing happens, and you get control returned back to you, and about that fast. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will say I do have a complaint with, um, w one of the things is with the way you level up is if you ever fight a group of enemies that is a level underneath you, um, you only ever get one experience from all of those battles. Uh, no matter how hard they still might be, if they are slightly underleveled compared to you, you only get one experience points. And, and that's supposed to get rid of grinding, which is a good thing, but um, I feel it sort of takes away from it if you put a lot of work into fighting a certain enemy. Yeah, it's kind of silly that they force you to learn how all the enemies work when the bosses have their own mechanics, which you actually have to learn. Like, the only thing that those regular enemies prepare you for is how to push buttons. None of them actually show up in the boss fights where the bosses have their own unique attacks. Yeah. Which, uh, which one are we specifically talking about here? Uh, so the one I'm, I'm talking about both uh, Superstar Saga and uh, Thousand Year Door, because those are the two that I've played that use uh, those kinds of mechanics. Yeah. Uh, uh. Yeah, there are. Some... I like Superstar Saga. Mm -hmm. I, I like it too. It's it's a really good game. Um, a lot shorter than I remember, but um, uh, right now I'm playing through Thousand Year Door again, and it's also a pretty good game. But um, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot to be. They're very RPG light games, I guess is a good way of describing them. That's what they're usually referred to. They're, um... 
they're really simplified compared to a lot of RPGs, and I think that's part of the things I. Uh, that's one of the things I like about them is that they're really easy to jump into, compared to, I don't know. Um, give me an example. Dragon Warrior Seven. Yeah. There. <laughs> Valkyrie Profile. Uh, yeah. But uh, I never played a Paper Mario, but I I I'm pretty sure I know of like the mechanics, like where you have to like time a button press stuff for like abilities, right? Yes. Mm. I would say, I, like, I'm only half serious when I say this, but I, I think it's almost inherently better than uh, traditional RPG combat because mm. you can essentially do what, like, the old, you know, like, the more, uh, I guess you say, generic combat does, but more. Like, there's nothing, let's say, like, there's nothing Paper Mario can't do that Final Fantasy does, but there's yeah. plenty that Paper Mario can do that Final Fantasy can't. Yeah. Let's say Final yeah. Fantasy VII. Like, I, that's the only one I really have experience with. Because you can add, like, all different sort of mechanics for characters and stuff instead of kind of relying on numbers and statuses. Yeah. And uh, Paper Mario and Superstar Saga, like the whole Mario RPG series, they all do that really well. Uh, because in Super Mario RPG, for the Super Nintendo way back, you had you had elements, you had fire, you had lightning, you had ice, and... Mallow had Thunderbolt, and it was very effective against aquatic creatures, you know, as it should be, as you would expect in any RPG. But you also had the ability to make it a timed hit and increase its damage. And then, because of the nature of the Mario RPGs, there are other elements that aren't explored in any other RPG, such as with the spiny enemies, you can't jump on them. You can't use jump abilities. So if you're Mario, you have to use your hammer, or you just punch them in the face, or whatever you have. <laughs> Yeah. I will say that there's a lot more, I think, thinking on your feet with those than some other RPGs. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, I've heard a lot of mixed opinions on active time battles lately. You know, the ATB that's used from FF4 to FF9. Is that yeah. the wrong kind of thinking on your feet? Um, I'd say it's doing a thing that kind of arbitrarily speeds up the process. It, it um... Do you know what I mean? Because it, it doesn't... It's not doing anything that makes you have to strategize any better. It makes more you just have to mash the buttons faster. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're not, you're not being rewarded for, like, having a skill or timing something right. It's just kind of... Yeah. Yeah, you're in you're in more of a rush and you gotta pay more attention. Yeah. There aren't that many games that uh do ATB that do timing. There are a couple, um, but the majority of them, yeah, no. So I played the first disc of FF seven, and the only enemy I remember that had any sort of timing bonus was the scorpion at the beginning of the game, where hey, don't attack it while its tail's raised. And that was the only gimmick uh, with ATB that I ever saw. Were there any more down the line in that game, or ever? Well, I mean, I think that that's a bit generous to be calling that an ATB mechanic, but... <laughs> no idea. Like, I remember, well, for FF7, I remember there was this one setup I really liked, where I had cast Haste and Regen on a character, and they're basically immortal, and... That's not really a that's not really a specific setup, but with ATB it's pretty clear that like oh this guy's going faster and then like ev like every turn they heal up like this amount and then like and like that's good, right? Yeah. With the ATB it's pretty clear that they're going faster than everyone else and like that. But you could kind of like do it with CTB and like the charge turn battle and like it would actually work better there because you could like predict it right yeah yeah the charge turn battle being uh, what final fantasy tactics and i believe ff10 use sort of yeah yeah and like i guess i guess atb is is serviceable but like but like in general it's like not very impressive like, whatever ATB sort of does for turns, like, CTB does better. Yeah. because In C my opinion. 
because CTB basically automatically fills the bars and then gives you all the time in the world to strategize, which is usually how people play their RPGs. Yeah. yeah. And then, like, for comparison's sake, in FF7, like, you could kind of switch this up in the options, but, like, if you're, like, rummaging through your menus and stuff, you're, like, the timer might still be ticking, and then... In some really bad cases, the enemy gets several turns while you're trying to select the thing that you want to use. Mm. So it makes it even like less incentivized to use magic skills or whatever awesome abilities you have. It's yeah. kind of weird. Yeah. Mm. I feel like if you're going to go that route, that you should probably go the route of um, uh, Dot Hack Gu. I felt that they handled that one pretty dang well. Dot hack to you? How did they handle it? Um, it was a lot more timing, um, timing focused because you would have uh, juggling mechanics, um, boundary uh, hits. It was kind of like a, well, okay, it was an MMO that was. It was an action game, by the way. <laughs> yes, it was an action game. Um, it's an action RPG, but I feel like if you're gonna go ATB, you should probably go that route and have mechanics that like um, deal with timing. Uh, positions. I feel so like ATB bumps. works better for action games or something? Uh, ish. Taking a page from it, at least. Mm. You know what I game see had, a, had a really good battle system that for some reason I don't think has ever got copied or like upgraded in any other game is uh, the original Shadow Hearts. And it's, uh, for, for those who don't know, it's basically like there's a ring and um, you have like a line that spins around it and you have to like time it and like press for like when it hits a certain part of the ring mm. and you get like like it'll have like a wide space if you just want to get the attack through but at the very tip of the space will be like a, a critical center where if you time it right there you'll get like you know extra damage and stuff mm. but if you mess up then you know you don't get the attack in. My only caveat with it was I really wanted an auto button later on in the game, which would just oh, yeah. that, give that does make grinding like kind kind of annoying because you auto can't just, button? Like, zone out. What do you mean auto button? Like uh, as just have them just, fight just, by themselves? Yeah. As in just yeah. just roll the percent chance for me rather than me having to time it because I really don't uh, know. or maybe if something like if you auto like they all do half damage. But it's like a guaranteed hit, so like, like grinding for items and shit won't be that bad. Uh, uh, it seems like the more complicated we make combat mechanics, the harder it is to grind. Because <laughs> you are you're placing a whole bunch of artificial time into the combat, whereas, you know, you want the button presses during bosses because it's super exciting, but then if you're just going through, you know, random encounters and trying to breeze through them as quickly as possible, it's just like, no, just die already, please, just die, could you die? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, I Earthbound like at some did point the thing. What Earthbound did the thing where if you're so if you're over leveled to a point compared to your en enemy, they just immediately die and give you the experience points <laughs> as soon yeah. as the battle starts. Yeah, I would not sure if that's the battle screen. I would just kill them on the map and give XP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but. That that's a big problem. If you plan on having an elaborate battle system, you've got to be careful not to have a lot of grinding involved when it comes to winning. Yeah, you either got to focus on the skill of the mechanics or like the number game. Yeah. Oh man, that are we are we back to talking about like leveling systems? Because there is one story I wanna I wanna talk about. Battle systems, <clears throat> leveling systems often are hand in hand. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Well, okay. Tales of uh, okay. I don't play the Tales game, so it's one of the old Tales games. Uh, it's uh, I, I forgot what it was, but they had an auto battle system, right? Because that's 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 what made me think about this. So it has an auto battle system where you can just have everyone attack automatically, and you could you could kind of set up your controller to have the guy just walk in a circle in the in the overworld map mm -hmm. so they just walk in a circle and you can auto battle and that's just free experience for as long as you want 
However, the game has a counter for this, right? Mm -hmm. You want to know what that counter is? The, ca the, the counter for this auto-grinding thing is there is a guy that will show up and he and he's an encounter and he's like you better fucking run away or else i'll just murder you yeah yeah that and shows up in uh, persona too no 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 this guy this guy is a is an actual character though because he's he's also the secret boss he he goes against a lot of the conventional stuff in compared to the rest of the game because he's like He's like this wandering badass, I guess, with an axe. I forgot his name, but everyone. But I think he's really popular because he's because one of his abilities is if you use an item during your fight with him, he will he will just get mad and use his limit break. No items ever, <laughs> and then he'll, and then he outright kills your guy with his <laughs> badass combo. Interesting. And then the only the only way you can get out of that fight is, like, if you encounter him in the overworld, you, the only way you can get out of that alive is if you run away. And he gives you the chance to run away too. Like oh. he he will he will wait like like a good te five or ten seconds before he starts murdering you. Oh, but if you still have auto battle on and you're not paying attention, then you're toast. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's how they dealt with that. And I really like this guy too because, like, remember when I said he was a secret battle? You you know how you could make his battle the hardest thing ever hmm. is if because you can you can change the difficulty in in the options menu for that game I think or some some other tales game and you could set it to really easy. So you set it to really easy and then you go challenge him, and then he makes. And then he he goes like really easy. I'll show you really easy. And then he uses his straight up supers right away. <laughs> Pretty insane. That's great. Yeah, he's he's like the funnest. He's like one of the funnest characters. Oh, man, mm. I can, I just can't remember his name. Uh, going back to something I I asked a couple podcasts ago. That is a really good fuck you in a game. You know, that's a that's a good example of a game messing with you because. I assume you can change the difficulty anytime you want. Yeah, yeah, as long as you can access your menu. Yeah, see, you save the game, you put it on really easy, then he makes fun of you and kicks your ass. That's a real, that's a fun fuck you. I would enjoy a game doing mm. that. <laughs> but, uh, anyhow, um, what were we talking about before that? Paper Mario? Video games. <laughs> <laughs> yep, video games. Uh, Time hits are okay. Time hints are okay, I guess. It depends. Uh, like it's a little cheap for getting the person involved, but it's it's pretty effective at what it does. Yeah. Oh, uh, I remember what I was gonna say. Uh, so we were talking about how the timed hit animations kind of extend the length of random encounters and mess that all up. I think that Paper Mario handles that really well because your your levels matter quite a bit. And once you face enemies that are weaker than you, you take them down in one hit. And at the very least, by fighting them and getting that one timed hit, you are still practicing the timed hit mechanic, which is going to be useful throughout the entire game. Mm -hmm. So, you know, running isn't too hard in that game either. So if you don't want to fight them, you just mash A and you're gone. If you want to fight them, then bing, bang, boom, they're gone. And the... Uh, and I, th I think that's why they keep the numbers low. Now, for other games, I really can't say. <laughs> mm. So, what's your guys' favorite combat system that you've encountered? And for me, it's really tough uh, for for specifically the, the Paper Mario games because I like an active system that uh, rewards me for remembering and applying that kind of stuff. So, you know, this enemy attacks now, this is when I block. This attack works best if I press it here. And I like... Not only uh, Superstar Saga, because it has... It, it basically, every move is a dance move. You have to press A here, then B, then A, then B, and then re rotate the control pad or something. But then you have, like, Super Mario RPG and Thousand Year Door, where there's different gimmicks put into each one. So, uh, in Super Mario RPG, Mario has his 
fireball ability that you just you just mash the button as fast as you can and that does the damage or uh, there's one where you rotate the control pad or there's his super jump where after the 18th jump you have about three frames to precisely enter jump and if you do that a hundred times in a row you get a special item <laughs> I I think they really went all out with the gimmicks and mechanics on Super Mario RPG and uh, they knew how to reward you for doing it right mm -hmm. I would probably say my favorite is Shadow Hearts that I mentioned before yeah, it's not too complex, but when you get a critical, it's just it's so satisfying. <laughs> it's like the perfect amount of difficulty. I'd say um, probably mm -hmm. one of um, the uh, Mario and Luigi games, like the third one, has a pretty good one. Which one's uh, the third one? Yeah, because they're not numbered, so. <laughs> uh, it's um, Bowser's Inside Story is what it's called. It's um, good because it switches, you have two things because you've got, um, it switches between you play as Bowser and you also play as Mario and Luigi, and the combat is completely different um, between them because Bowser works on a complete heavy, um, heavy hitting and with no dodging, but rather uh, turning the enemy's attack against them rather than dodging and attacking back. Hmm. Just like in Smash Brothers. Uh, I know that I wouldn't have the time for it these days, um, but to this day, still, Xenogears wins my battle system vote. Your, um, your battle system foo? Yeah, did, <laughs> vote. I, I, I thought you might have some, said foo. Mm. No, no. Um, it's just it had such a good mind about um, each turn being its own turn, but also a part of a larger strategy. Um, and that just the individual attacks that you inputted also changed the results of what would occur that turn. All right. If you haven't played Xenogears, I recommend you try it out mm. for a little bit. Hmm. Let's well, see. I... Oh, you have one? Oh, no, I already said Oh, yeah. okay. We're just waiting on a you and Windsor right now, Robin. All right. Well, well you guys, uh, 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 you I'll can go. go. Ahead, Windsor. Thank you. I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't made a big secret of this, but my favorite battle system is um, Super Smash Brothers Melee. There's incredible layers of complexity, <laughs> but it's also simple enough that a player can pick it up. Uh, d do you want me to talk about Melee for half an hour, or should we just let no. um, Robin go? <laughs> Robin, whenever you're ready. <laughs> All right, all right. So, all right. The the battle system I'm thinking about because I don't I don't play too many RPGs or like too many different varieties of RPGs. So, my my scope's a little limited. But the one that I remember fondly is from Wild Arms Four. Please go play the Wild Arms series. It's great. It's pretty good. Uh, they're all a little different from each from each other and. You don't need to know anything in between the games, just like Final Fantasy. So if you're worried about that, don't worry. You can play 4 or 1 or whatever. The story's different. But the settings, like, basically the same. So in the system in 4, it's nice um, because they they have, like... Okay, one, one thing they do is they use the charge turn battle thing, the CTB, for, for taking turns. And that's... Okay, I guess. It is like like when you enter a battle, you're on a grid. Um I'm kind of like a small tactics grid, but it's like it's not square, it's a hexagonal shape. Think of like a think of like a honeycomb shape thing, right? Alright. So that's that's what the map is shaped like. So So you have this small area and then you're your characters can move around and attack in the small area. Any enemies that share the same space, if you hit, if you attack that space, they, everyone in that space gets hit. Hmm. So, so sometimes you want to group together your guys so that you can heal everyone easily. Or sometimes you want to spread them out so that they don't all get hit by strong attacks or something. And... Some some of the bosses also like really play with this idea. 
because uh, it's it's just pretty fun. Like, uh, I guess small spoilers for some of the bosses. Like, there was this one boss where his ability was to manipulate time. And if you try to attack him, he will just walk to a dif- He will stop time, he will walk to a different space, <laughs> and you will hit nothing. <laughs> and the way you're... And the way you're supposed to combat him is you have to corner him in a way that he cannot move. Because <laughs> enemies cannot share the same space as your guys. Hmm. So, so you had to corner him in such a way that he could not get away from his space. I mean, he does have a teleport, but you could just, you could just corner him again. Because by, that, by then you already know, oh, okay... Okay, this is how you beat this guy. Oh god, imagine doing that like like freezing time but you can't move anywhere. So so you're just stuck there like <laughs> terrified. Like oh god. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, the battle system for 4. I'll spoiler another another boss, I think. Um god damn it. There was like another boss who was like you you could like like if you attack this one boss, they they would counterattack in such a way that it will hit the space you're on and the spaces next to you. So you couldn't group together your guys. Hmm. You had to space them out in such a way that this boss couldn't counter all your guys because the counterattack was really strong and it would really disrupt majority of your guys if all of them got hit. Hmm. You know, and those are the kind of mechanics I like, if if I can crank back to what we were talking about an hour ago, where it's not exactly a gimmick. If if you understand what's happening, it's very easy to circumvent and plan around it. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, I wanted a disclaimer something that I just that I said um, a little bit ago. Uh, for those of you who have played Xenogears, I am not at all talking about the gear battles. The gear battles can go fuck themselves. The character <laughs> battles is what I'm talking about. Cool. All right. I can't believe you aren't having fun fighting giant robots. I would have fun fighting giant robots if it were not a series of pressing X because there is no better option but to press X <laughs> repeatedly until the battle is over. To press X or not to press X? That's the question. There's like one fight in which you might go, mm, maybe that's too much fuel. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I think we're running out of time, wouldn't you say? I would. I would agree. I just got uh, the new Senran Kagura in mail. I'm ready to, I'm ready to play that. Ready to rumble. Okay, jump. why don't we end off by saying who we main in Smash. Who I main, mean, sir. This is Cody signing off. I am a combination Marth Pack main. Nice. Hello, or goodbye. I am Carvonic, and I I like to play as DDD. Because that's, that's the kind of person I am. You've been enjoying the audio stylings of Sam Windsor, who is a dedicated moth, but with a back pocket peach. I don't play those newest shit games. They're not even real video games, as far as I'm concerned. They're fucking button-pressing simulators. Please, my friends, introduce yourselves at, at the end of the podcast for some fucking reason. Fergoff, you do it. Okay. Um, a disclaimer about all of my opinions in this podcast should be labeled with... Dirty, dirty fox, one hundred percent player. Oh, nice. Oh boy. Oh man. Blue Sky Robin likes villager. Yay, villager. Am I the last guy? Am I the only one yes. left standing right now? Yes, sir. Uh, this is Souls, and I'm gonna. I suck at picking mains like that, but I'm gonna probably go with Cloud for right now. I wonder if there's anyone who actually mains Roy. Why would you actually I could main rock Mark? I really like Roy in Smash 4 because he feels like the only melee character in the game. I can play as Roy and I don't feel disgusted with myself when I play Smash 4. I mean, why would you main Roy when you can re- main Iggy or any of the other better Koopa kids? <laughs> <laughs> or... <laughs> I was just wondering, what is Iggy? And then, oh, okay. Alright, and thank you all for listening to the RPG MGP. Goodbye.